The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 300 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code. Good on what your next order at fansets.com just for discovering Trek listeners. Fansets, our pins have character. Well, hello, listeners. Casey and Sarah here, and this is Discovering Trek Enterprise. Welcome to the First Frontier. The two of us non-sanctioned delegates are talking about another episode of Enterprise. This is the full series watch through for me, and it's a rewatch for Casey. Today, we're contemplating about the episode Fallen Hero. This episode traveled over the airwaves into your TV unit about 20 years ago on May 8, 2002. If you haven't watched this episode yet and you don't want to be spoiled, go hit up Paramount Plus, Netflix, or Amazon Prime, or grab your DVDs, or heck, your old VHS, if this even went out on VHS, and watch the episode. (laughs) Then come back here, post haste, and join us chatting about Fallen Hero, and let me know if this was ever on VHS. (laughs) Logic (laughs) dictates that as of now, our non-warning spoiler warning has concluded. Excellent. And everybody, you know what? Before we get into Fallen Hero, we want to remind you that we want to hear from our listeners about everything Enterprise. So how can you get in touch with us with your thoughts on the first season of Star Trek Enterprise? What a great question, Casey. There are a bunch (laughs) of ways listeners can do that. (laughs) Of course, you can go to trekgeeks.com slash contact and leave an email to get us your thoughts or Twitter or Facebook. All you got to do is search for Discovering Trek and you can leave us a message there too. Or you could leave us a voicemail by visiting our website at trekgeeks.com and clicking on that big blue button. But remember, any comments you leave us might be used in a future episode of Discovering Trek. All right, enough of that. Let's get on to that pie chart because I think you may have given a number of how many slices of pie out of six you give this episode. How did you know? I like just you know. We have a oh. system in place. Oh. Well, after the craptastic episode that was Voxola, I gave <laughs> Fallen Hero a 5.5. I really enjoyed this episode. I thought they were great performances going all along, and this to me was a huckleberry, deep pie, extra thick crust, top and bottom. Hmm. Wow. How about you? I gave it four. I gave it four because I don't remember anything special standing out about it, and therefore I that's a sign because there's been episodes where it's been a while and I'll be like, Oh, I, but I liked this. And I was excited about this. And like, you know, like fallen son, a fortunate son. And there was a couple that really stood out. Yeah. But for this one, I was looking back on it and I remember enjoying the acting in this one. And I knew it was a bit more of a standout episode as being really good, but I still. Yeah. Okay. And hey. then I had to write the recap and I had ra- I'd written really terrible notes when I watched the episode and it didn't help me really remember fully all the details, but it gave me the general gist. So this is a very high level, uh, ah. high level overview, the kind of language I use in the government of uh, this is. Okay. I no, like this it. Is, we're not in depth here. We're giving you a one page or high level overview of the episode. So get ready. Excited. Woo. Are you? Oh, please. Okay. Let me get my Trello ready. Here it is. Dun, dun, dun. The show starts off awkward to Paul says take a break and talk of sexual tension is left in her wake. But despite the Hawaiian shirt, a job they must do, a Vulcan needs a ride home, her job it is through. Don't shake hands or laugh. There are protocols in place. But instead of being stuck up, she is full of grace. She's been expelled for misconduct. At least that's what's said. And Hoshi is kind to give up her bed. Paul remembers the Vulcan from her younger years. She wants to go back. She just has no fears. She is innocent of all. That's the story we know. 
She can't reveal the mission. That's why she's let go. Please drop out of warp. Surrender, I will. It hasn't gotten to that yet. The script fits the bill. The rumors of warp five are tested as such, but Vulcan's hit warp seven, clearly a faster touch. The port injector's blue. Communication is nay. Get the ambassador now. Down to sickbay. Prepare to be boarded. See her, we must. I'm afraid she is dead. To ashes, to dust. But psych, she is not. Give an Oscar to Phlox. That's my rhyme wrapped up in a box. Well, that was fantastic. I don't know why you thought this would, that was like an overview. That was dead on. Well, it misses out the meat and potatoes of what made this episode really, really good. And that was the relationship built between the ambassador and to Paul mm-hmm. and those realizations of just how shady the Vulcans are. And so, yeah, like I said, I, I gave it the four because it does have it does have really good plot development for the Vulcans and just how mm-hmm. sketchy they are, and I've been enjoying that because we've seen it with the Andorians and such. But there was something about it that just kind of still dragged for me, and I don't know what it was, but hmm. weird. Because yeah, well, I wrote that in my notes, being like, "Oh, it was good," but I got bored, and that's like, well, then that's just my personality and the way I'm drawn in sometimes, and the way I'm not drawn in. There you go. Yeah. Hey, we we all have our likes, dislikes, and and everything that comes into it. I yeah. hear you. Uh, gosh, I think like you you just said here, and you know, in in our thoughts, our transporter thoughts here, I found it a really refreshing change in the episode that the emphasis was on two female characters mm-hmm. and the interactions between those two actors. Uh, I found very mature, thoughtful, uh, in-depth, and something that, I mean, you know, the the, the silliness of, of Tripp and his Aloha shirt, eh, okay, <laughs> the silliness at the beginning of, you know, Tripp and Archer being like, oh, well, why do you think we need to have sex? What You know, what's going on here? And it was this like... Oh, okay. And then it just, piv- for me, pivoted completely out of that BS really quick. And we got, you know, we got Finola Flanagan, right, as Valar. And every time in this episode when she came on, in my head, I just flipped it to Lavar. Yeah. Every time. And I was like, oh, it's like, no, Valar, Valar, get it right. But gosh, you know, she's been in TNG. ES9. She had a, a great role in Lost. She's done a ton of stuff. I mean, really, if you want to see what she's done, please go check out her IMDb credits. They're quite amazing. I'm looking at it right now. Right? And you can just keep scrolling for a good long time with yeah. the amount of stuff. I loved her as Mrs. Mills in the movie The Others. You know, mm. nice little horror suspense flick. It's great. But yeah, I found the relationship between these two um, more realistic in a portrayal than we've seen in other episodes of Enterprise. And there seemed to be a, a honest, I'll say, you know, respect and not necessarily a friendship, but an openness, friendliness to each other that went both ways. You've got the, the person being the hero and the other person worshiping the hero, but I mean, worshiping is the wrong word. I think on this one, I just, I just kept coming to respect mm-hmm. in it. And I don't know. Did you notice this? Sir? It was like to Paul on how she was portrayed in this episode seems like a little bit nervous and want like wants to make a good impression. Mm-hmm. On yeah. Lamar. I mean, that's as close as that's the closest we're ever going to see to Paul fumbling around nervously to to make an impression that's as close as it gets for that Vulcan but it's very much a thing and it's and it's and it's not hero worship but it's admiration and respect and it's there you go it's um intimidation but in a good way in the Mm. in that kind of sense um when you admire somebody and never think that you'll meet them so you don't know even how to like conceptualize (laughs) what it would be like if you do 
suddenly it's yeah. like I now I don't know what to say and I've always imagined I'd have all these things to say and that that pressure that's put on it yeah it was well done that was fun that was fun okay question for you uh have you ever met either a role model or somebody you admired in your life that like wasn't part of your family no you, okay. you hit me with yeah. this question in advance and, and gave me the opportunity to think on it and I I've I've never met anybody that I've admired or or looked up to as a as a hero or and I don't even have any I mean okay. I I think that if characters were real then I, there would be people that I would want to meet like I always uh -huh. the, the few people that I look up to that I just love I wouldn't want to meet the actor that plays him because I'm like you're not the character you know like if I ever met Mariska Hargitay I'm like you're not Olivia Benson from Law and Order this is <laughs> this sucks <laughs> like you're just a beautiful actress who's really talented and has her own life I don't like that you're supposed to be wearing a power suit right now like you know <laughs> so I think there's a part of me that kind of like whenever I meet actors I'm always a little bit like oh yeah you're just an actor who's just <laughs> messed up like the rest of us I'll have to beat that one <laughs> but do you know what I mean like I don't if I was oh, to yeah. really think of anybody who was a real person I mm -hmm. there's definitely people I would like to meet and it would probably be people of the of that like Paul Holes like the the FBI former agent that brought down the the Golden State Killer like I would love to meet somebody like that like that to be like as a hero mm -hmm. saving lives and and risking everything so yeah there's there's nobody that i really except okay. when i get to meet you oh oh my goodness gracious i'm blushing so much my right hero. now oh <laughs> well i you know i i hear what you're saying because part of it is like my one of my grandfathers was a volunteer uh fire chief for about 25 years mm -hmm. so seeing him and hearing stories from him of, you know, like real ooh, scary mm -hmm. stuff that happened. Um, but part of my family. And then I remember being, I, it was like 1978 and our, our family was down in LA eating at the great American food and beverage company, which I don't know if it even exists anymore, but you know, I'm there 10 years old and I look over and there's this other waiter, not even for our table, other waiter. I go, I think that's Peter Tork from the monkeys and I'm mm. 10 years old. So the monkeys was in big rotation on a local TV station. So I don't know if he really was a, a hero or a role model, but it was just like, I like those guys. Oh, they're having fun. Oh, Hey, they're musicians. And I was like, and I don't have musical talent at all. So I'd always like, Oh, that would be great to be able to do that. Um, and I asked our waiter, I was like, is, you know, is that Peter Tork? And he says, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. And I guess our waiter went over to Peter at some point and said, hey, this, this little kid would love to meet you. Mm -hmm. and Peter Tork comes over. I mean, this is a guy who's been on a TV show for X amount of time in a band. And, and you know, he's had to work as a waiter for, okay, make ends meet, whatever you got to do. But he came over and spent like a good five to 10 minutes talking with me. That's so cute. And we took a picture. I've still got his uh, autograph thing here that he, you know, gave to me on a, a little waiter's ticket. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I think part of that where, yeah, you can fear meeting people that you admire in, in different domains, because what mm -hmm. if they're jerks? Mm -hmm. And can you enjoy their work mm -hmm. after that? or not and it's like ah oh, okay. and it's and it's that it's that sad realization of like because when I get into a fandom I get really into it like I get I don't get obsessed with it but I get really into it and I want to know about the actors and what else they've done and I want to know the backstory and I want to know like as much as I can so it becomes a really big part of my life and so when you meet these people seeing them is everything to you and to them you're just one of a thousand people that they have to say hi to and it's like yeah it just it just puts into perspective how unspecial you are to them I mean they appreciate their fans of course they do and I, I've never had a negative experience meeting anybody they've always been very gracious but I know I know going in I'm not going to be able to be like well, we're going to become best friends now yeah. and we're going to go have dinner and it's going to be no and so just knowing that it's just like eh 
that's not it's, anything yeah. that I had fantasized about at all. Right. Or like I when I you. met the, uh, I met the guy, I can't remember his name, Alan Ruck from okay. um, Ferris Bueller and yeah. a number of things. Love him. Just a great character actor. And I got to get a photo with him and Brad was there. And so I was like, didn't want to like be totally embarrassing to him is like, oh, sorry, my boyfriend's being dragged to watch me get a photo <laughs> with this actor. But I went up and I was like, there was nobody there. There's no lineup. Mm-hmm. There was nothing. And I was like, I am so excited to see you. Like, I, that's how I said it. I was like, this is the best. Like, you're the greatest. He's like, oh, thank you so much. And like, it's really nice to meet you. I'm like, dude, you're the coolest ever. And like, Brass yeah. was like nodding his head, like, let's get her out of here. And it was so <laughs> awkward, but it was like, it was such a nice moment because he was so like surprised to see somebody be just like so excited to see him. And I was like, dude, like, what are you doing here? Like, this is so cool. You came to Vancouver for us. Like, cause yeah. we don't, we know we're only starting to get more of these types of events in Vancouver and and BC and so when they come it's like thanks for coming here <laughs> like or when they well, came you, to the island like I'm always so excited like you made you a get trip Cameron from Bueller I mean that's awesome yeah and oh, I I hear you I hear you. it was it was I was I'm trying to think either late 20s early 30s and for the place I was working at the time we had Reggie Jackson baseball player come in do a guest talk for us. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends is a huge open A's fan Mm -hmm. and like had all his childhood baseball cards in this huge binder. And I said, give me your binder. I'll see if I can get him to sign something. And at the time, like Mr. Jackson's rep was, he's not going to, he comes in, he's going to do the talk and then he's out. You know, here's the time period. He's out, no autographs, no nothing. And he, like, Reggie stayed about half hour longer with us because he was on stage. <laughs> and, and, you know, our CEO was like, oh, well, well, you know, hey, the time's up. And Reggie's like, I can stay. That's fine. He was having a great time. I was like, okay. And then when he came off stage and he was coming down and I had been directing the event and I had the binder and I had a Sharpie in my hand, I said, when am I going to have this chance again? It's mm-hmm. like, okay. And I just said, Hey, Mr. Jackson, it's great to see you. Would you mind signing your card? And he looked at the binder and I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a four inch thick binder. So yeah. he flips it to the front of the beginning of it. And he, he went through page by page looking at all the cards of his teammates. That's and, so cool. and I'm just standing there with him. Like, do I say something? Do I not say something? Oh my God. I don't know what's happening to do all that stuff. And um, while he was doing that, I just like blurted out, I go, Hey, you know, year, years ago, a friend of my dad's on a plane, you were on a plane with him. He got me your autograph. I have that one. And that's why I'm asking you like to sign this for my friend. And he was like, absolutely no problem. Signs, signs the card, you know, I'm, I'm going, <laughs> blowing on it. So that the ink dries as quickly as possible. And, and then he goes, doesn't sign anything for anybody else. Mm-hmm. And like you're saying, it's like, I'm one in a million people. So it meant like, okay, I'm meeting the one person he's meeting the millionth mm-hmm. type thing, but it worked out wonderfully. And then I was able to give something to my friend of like, Hey, I, I did it. He didn't get mad at me. No one got mad at me. You're the only one who got an autograph. Happy birthday. And so it's yeah. it's interesting like you're saying it's i don't know if it's all hero worship admiration like of the work that they do mm-hmm. uh or, or whatever and when you can meet somebody and they at least stay at a certain level of what you would think they are or when they're just human beings again oh, like yeah. you are me- meeting people at stlv in the elevators and I've done it where I see somebody and I stink at remembering names. I'm awful at it. But I see them and it just clicks into my head. And I'm just like, hey, it's so great to see you. I'm glad you're here. And they said, oh, well, thank you. Glad you're here too. And then I shut up. I turn around and shut up because I want to do something stupid yeah. after that. <laughs> Casey Biggs, whenever he's walking down the hallway, I just point out, oh, Casey, Casey. And that's it. And he's like, you know, gives it a thumbs up. And I just keep walking. I'm like, okay, don't make a fool of yourself. I have Casey Biggs and I had a moment and it was amazing. 
It was tell at, me, tell me. It was at the pub that was at the Rio. And this was mm. 10 years ago. This was a or this was yeah, it was at STLV 2011. I went by myself and I was sitting at the pub talking to people, having a drink. I was wearing a nice dress, feeling good, looking good on a vacation. And he's across the bar and we locked eyes like two or three times. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. I hear the wedding music in my head. This is happening. No, <laughs> I wasn't thinking that. But I went over and I was like, I got to say hi. And he's like, I noticed you from across the bar and love your tattoos. Cause that's the thing I stick out sometimes like a sore thumb with my, my tattoos. And I was like, Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Can't hide them now. Like I'm stuck with them or whatever. And I just said, loved you on the show, but I love it when you guys do the mm. Rat Pack thing. Mm-hmm. I am a jazz fiend, mm. love that kind of music. And he's like, Oh, you like that? And I'm like, I love it. And it's so great. And I'm so glad to see you here. Have a fun night. I'm out. Like I paid my bill. Like I was, I was leaving at that point, but I was like, that's fantastic. Amazing. Right? It's like that. It's like, a, it's like those things you see in a movie where like your eyes lock and you just wait mm-hmm. for like little twinkles to come down and like <laughs> Barry White music starts. And you're like, we're having a moment and it's going to be the best moment. And that was it. it was a, that's a great moment. Very nice and person. All, right? Yeah. And, and I, I love and those I concerts. Think... Those were my favorite. They oh. were always so good. It's the same bloody songs every year. And I love them. I love the songs. I think this year... Nana is going to uh, join them on stage oh. for a bit. So your bo- your borders better okay. open up. Dang it. And you get your, your buns down there because we'll get have some buns fun. buns down there. All right. You know what Make else is like fun? like a red truck and haul some buns. <laughs> I love that one. I'm stealing that from you, my friend. Just so you know. I will pay you a nickel every time I use it, though. Ooh, an American nickel. Mm-hmm. I it's promise. Like seven cents. <laughs> Ooh. And I'll need those seven cents because you know what? You're going to do keep, some shopping. I'm going to do some shopping. And yeah. I loves it. Discovering Trek listeners, I know you love it too. We want to thank our friends at Fansets for being the exclusive sponsor on Discovering Trek. The Fansets crew are constantly working to put out the best product available and come up with new designs and product releases. There are more wonderful new products out right this very moment. There's, of course, all of the character pins, the newest Delta Magnet pin, the visitor pin from Picard, pins from all Trek series, Delta pins, full size and minis, Picard pins, of course, amazing non-Trek pins, Scooby-Doo, Xenoscope, Harry Potter, that my friend right there likes very much, and DC Comics. There are hundreds of pins and accessories for you at fansets.com. So right after listening to us, go on over to fansets.com, scroll along all the amazing pins that are offered, load up your cart and enter the special code word, Discovering Trek. In all caps, no spaces, please. And do that at checkout for an amazing 10% off your entire order. And don't forget, if you're in the US and you spend more than $30, you also get some free shipping. I just went onto their website because I haven't browsed their Harry Potter collection in a while. Oh my gosh, I want Snape. I want Sirius Black. I want Remus Lupin. I want Mad Eye Moody. I want all of those old fogies. They're the best. So well, now I got to do it. You know what to do when we're done recording here. Yep. Yeah. You know it. So that's it. Fan sets. Their pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fan sets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trick Geeks Podcast Network. Nice. <sighs> There's something, yeah, ooh, right? There's something coming from the from the kitchen. It's living in the fridge. Mmm. All right. My friend, Chef's special today is kind of a little trip down memory lane. Mm. So basically, this is a question for you, Sarah. It's <laughs> a question memory for lane, me. great. My memory's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's I was like, okay. Don't like it's going down that road. You ate in the last three days. <laughs> yeah. But even for our listeners, is there... Is there an item that you loved as a kid and can you then eat that item now and are you transported back to that time where you first had it or have your tastes completely changed or are they using massively inferior ingredients now so it's just never the same? And if you need a moment to think, 
no, let me no. know. I thought about this one, but I have a different kind of interpretation of it because okay. I there's not really much that I only ate as a child that I don't still eat now. I think if I was to maybe like, I would never subject myself to this because it's bad food. But if I was ever to go like maybe buy a, a can of zoodles or alfagetti, I think I'd be transported back very much to like a, uh-huh. being a kid with their hot little bowl of their making your, you know, watching whatever you want. Like that would be, I think one where I'd, I'd be like, oh yeah, this is, this is kid food because I wouldn't, <laughs> that's one of the ones where I'm like, now I'm like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do, do that. that. <laughs> I kind of want to. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I kind of want some alfagetti kind of right now. It's, it's not bad. Or the ravioli. Right? They're just, it's just so dirty. Like I don't, mm-hmm. I don't like to eat processed foods if I can avoid it. But um, the one, uh, but when I think about foods that have like an emotional uh, 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 attachment of a memory, mm-hmm. one of the ones that's always big for me. And I, I enjoy this as a dessert once in a while and, and try not to overdo it because I don't want it to become, you know, too common, but Every time I have a churro, I think of oh. Disneyland because okay. that would always be one of the few places where I would get a churro would be at the mm-hmm. cart at Disneyland. And there's a great little Mexican restaurant uh, near us that that makes them. And every time we order from them, I'll order a churro for us to split. And it's just that as soon as I bite into it, I'm like, right. oh, I'm waiting in line, complaining that it's too hot, trying to get on a splash <laughs> mountain where I'm going to get too wet and complaining that it's too wet. And I have to try and drive like, it's all the, the, the best place on earth. But you know that when you're there, you're complaining the whole time about like the lineups for the bathroom, my oh. feet hurt. It's too hot. It's too expensive. It's too busy. Like, it's always a thing, but it's still the best way to be annoyed. Oh man. It's my favorite there, place. So there you go. That would be a big one. And then maybe um something else as a kid that doesn't exist that I, I wish was still around were these they, we used to call them blood suckers and they were like a gummy worm, but they were like a really uh-huh. long, like a bit bigger than it t- and it was a snake. And uh-huh. it was um the white, like pineapple, I think is usually like the white flavor of like okay. a white gummy bear, and then red, and they'd be like white and red, and you get like a bucket of them like you would like a bucket of jube jubes or whatever. Yeah. And those were like the best when I was a kid, oh. and I've never seen them since. That would be one that I would hunt down for. There you go. Those would be good. I hear you. For me, it was, uh, I forget how how little I was, but I think I was with my mom and my grandmother's sister. So I was with my mom and Tata and we were visiting her and we went to a Denny's or something and she ordered clam chowder and I had never had it before in my life. Mm-hmm. Was and it the red or the white? The white, only the white. Sorry, it can't be the red. But the, the white and she gave me a taste of it and I loved it. So basically, unfortunately for her, I ate all her clam chowder, mm-hmm. but it was from that point on. And I think I was four or five. So whenever I have clam chowder now, and I still love clam chowder, but it, you know, it's gotta be good stuff. Yeah. Like you said, I'm instantly sitting in that booth, mm-hmm. you know, barely reaching the top of the, the table with, with her big soup spoon. And I'm like, oh, you know, this just reminds me of her. It's like, oh, Tata, she was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I do that. And then, you know, I have a little combo, with the dessert thing too. One is an Abba Zabba bar. Have you ever had one of those? Never heard of it. Oh my God. Mm. So it's white taffy. And then they inject peanut butter on the inside of it. Oh, Sarah, it's, it's the, oh my it is so good. God. Oh, that's two stories in this episode. I have some bleeping to do. Ooh, oops. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. It's so good. And they're, so they're made here in California, the uh, Annabelle candy company. They still make them. They're still pretty damn good. And, you know, you get them. And if, if they're a little bit cold, cause it's taffy, it's hard you, in the wrapper, you crack it on a table to get it in little chunks that way oh, you don't boy. pull your molars out. Yeah. And that one stays where I go, okay. And I've tried ice cream drumsticks, but they've, they've changed their ingredients so mm-hmm. much over the years where now, it, it, yeah, it doesn't have the same pull That's as funny. it did before. When you talked about the one that makes you think about your, your Tata, I was like, I guess I could think of a couple of candies that would make me think of my grandparents. Cause my one grandmother would always, or my great grandmother always had yogurt covered raisins. 
Okay. Like, which I would never eat now. It's, they're not that good. Yeah. But as a kid, I was like, oh, this is the closest thing you have to candy. Like, I'll have it. And then my other grandmother always had scotch mints in her pocket, like wrapped uh, up in a tissue. <laughs> like, so yeah. great. Okay. It was like, why are you wrapping this in paper? It, it comes in the, the, the crinkly it's stuff. Well, it's fine. I'm sure Keep your cardigan there. pocket isn't that dirty. So, yeah. When, when butterscotches oh, can come out of nowhere and you're like, well, all right, I'll just, Ears with my teeth, I'll just scrape the, yeah. the, the tissue off of that. Oh my gosh. Well, too funny. You know, that's part of what I was thinking about this whole episode. I was, I was like, you know, good for T'Pol meeting someone she admired good that there was a mutual respect happening yeah. and you know she wasn't bummed that her hero wasn't who she thought she was totally and you know what finishes that off you know it's our dessert for this episode what's it's closing that? time it's closing time it's a closing time <laughs> it's closing time you want to close this down I'm making you work for it i knew what you were trying to do a segue to and i was like no i'm not gonna say anything I'm make them work for it just like I'm going to have wow. to work to edit this episode because of all the <laughs> and swear. <laughs> we just had a bit of a hoot today. <laughs> I love it. It happens. It does. It's, it's, I'm surprised I've done as well as I have, considering that Rewind is a disaster potty mouth podcast. <laughs> We're recording today. Oh, <laughs> you're going to have fun. Can't oh, wait to hear that. I'm going to make a Caesar just for the occasion. Maybe two. All right. That concludes our coverage on this episode, Fallen Hero. We will be back next time to discuss Desert Crossing. <laughs> Just kidding, it's Desert Crossing. As we continue to celebrate the 20th anniversary year of Enterprise, until then, remember that you can subscribe to Discovering Trek by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or by heading to discoveringtrek.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Discovering Trek. Casey? Hey, Sarah, thank you. If you're enjoying what we're doing here on Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, please consider supporting us on Patreon. As a subscriber, you can get access to the unedited recordings of episodes, as well as exclusive content and great subscriber awards like our annual supporters pins from fan sets and our exclusive Trek Geeks Podcast Network t-shirt. We'd like to take a moment to recognize the following amazing producers. And they are... Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Lionel Marchand, Matt McGonagall, Jim McMahon, Darren Metcalf, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Chris Tribuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Warther, and Jess Vashon. The senior producer of Discovering Trek is... Jude Tatman. If you would like to become a producer of Discovering Trek or get access to the raw audio for Discovering Trek episodes, head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all of the details. Until the next, live long and prosper. Tune you out. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek is a production of Coconut Media Works, executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.